put in even. Yeah. Okay. okay. So when you see that you're on your second layer, you can you can start overlapping a little bit more. That's okay. good. Okay, you start from the water side again. The other way. Okay, maybe we should stop at this point. Are there any questions at this point? <laughs> I'll carry it over to your house. What is the leading edge of the map? Okay, it can go convex, concave. Um, as opposed to a sharp corner, it's preferred to curve a dike instead of making a square corner. Curved dike is stronger and will. Uh, but yeah, it can undulate and it can it can change direction. But try and keep your curves as gradual as possible. Okay. I went two bags. Okay, the the, uh, the two bags flush. Okay, or uh, two bags, two rows flush. Okay, this is going to be the critical one. Okay, hold it. I'm not finished. <laughs> That's, that's pretty close. What you want to do is come back about a quarter of a bag, okay? From the front, From the front okay? So the, the formula is every odd row, you go back a quarter of a bag. So in essence, you will be putting one bag less on that layer. And you will give it a slight step-like uh, step appearance. That's another advantage of this dike, is that now you're going to use the weight of the water to help. What happens if we build a sandbag that, uh, or a sand dike that's got a straight wall and it's holding no water? What wants to happen to that? Okay, it wants to fall outwards, and it will not take. All you have to do is catch a little bag, pull one little bag out, and the next thing you know is you see a whole series of of a dike go. Okay, to prevent that. That's why we build ours like pyramid, okay? So it will be every odd row, we go back a quarter of a bag, and that means that every time you go back, it will be running which direction? Parallel, Parallel to the water. And if you can remember at this point, you basically could build a sound dike. I'll go a little further, just so that it's ingrained in your memory. But uh, if you could get that formula, every odd row, go back a quarter. Okay, we'll place another row, and then we'll flip our poly. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't see with the sun. Yes, sir. If, okay, okay you're talking that uh, your dike is on the high ground and the, the water is lower. The, the, the land is sloping towards the water. Okay. If you have a significant angle to where you have concerns that the bags may slide and they will if they're on grass and they get wet. So if you, you, if you start getting a substantial slope, what I would recommend is that you drive stakes. Steel are preferred probably, and I don't know whether you'd encounter frost, but it's very difficult to drive wooden stakes deep enough because it would be nice if you had uh, pieces of rebar or something of that nature and drive that down about three feet and then do that every so often depending on, because you basically all you're gonna hold are these two rows of sandbags, right? The ones on the ground? Sure. And so if you just drive some rebar and just drive lots of rebar in, and then what you can do is use some uh, double two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, and with the wood between the dike and the stakes that you've driven, because basically all you want to do is to keep that bottom layer from sliding forward. 
Am I correct there? I see you nodding your head, so I thought it was safe to get a confirmation. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. I hate this question because it's a no win. Because if you bring the, and I, I apologize for not repeating the question. The question was, if I have a dike and I come up against a another hard surface, whether it be concrete, a building, or you're coming up against a wall, is that correct, sir? Okay. So the end of the dike is coming up against the wall. You have to go over. You can't. But to go over it incorporate it inside the dike, the dike will be weak, and the dike will, weak, uh, will leak. So the wall's got to go. If it's a fence or anything else, do not run it through the dike. I misunderstood your question. I thought, which is my dreaded question, is what happens if I take my dike and I want to come up against a wall, a smooth wall, and I want to stop it from leaking? What do you think my chances are? Okay, it's going to leak. Some people don't, so what I normally do is either go lower to get in front of the object, build a dike higher. Uh, some people tell me that it's absolutely, they have no choice. Uh, if you have concerns, I would suggest that you get a, uh, a technical survey done by the City of Winnipeg that you could phone the request in if you've got some real concerns and you think there's a technical problem and uh, that it could leak. It's a little unusual circumstance. Uh, call or... Uh, any of the uh, Doug McNeil or anybody on front, uh, leave your name. And uh, for those really tough spots that might need a technical opinion, an engineer's uh, look-see to see whether that thing is going to hold. What some people have done is they've taken the poly, and they've taken the poly which is incorporated in the dike, and what they do is they take a poly and they L-shape it, and they go along the smooth shape of the wall, but they go as much as you can. If it's a four, you know, if, it, if you can go four feet from the uh, the edge, the water side of the dike, four feet's good. And what they do is they put some silicone, and they silicone between the the poly and the uh, <clears throat> and the hard surface. And then what you do is you pack lots of sandbags all against that. So you uh, you actually make an L shape, and you build that really strong because you want to get lots of bags leaning against that poly because you want to hold it against that that smooth surface and you're going to try and stop the uh, the water and I'd suggest that you have a pump because it will still leak decks go decks go what part of decks do we not want to go Decks have got to go. Yes, sir. Minimum three feet. That also applies for the height. Because if you're utilizing my method, you're going to find that if you've got to go a high dike, you're going to run out of poly before you get to the top of the dike. Three feet before you get to the end of that, what I want you to do is take another piece of poly, place that one on top on the water side. Hold the two pieces together and as you're weaving it through the dike, eventually the old poly will disappear and then you continue on with the new one. But if you've got a three foot overlap and the way that I've got it snaking in through the, uh, through the dike, she'll be waterproof. That also applies for the end. If you happen to be building a dike and you're going to stop or say a neighbor has built a dike and you've got to join your dike, it's no time to get lazy. There's only one way to do it. If, if a neighbor has built a portion of a dike and you've got to add on to it, and I don't know whether you have that situation here like we do like on Scotia, where the, you know, a neighbor's already, he's ahead and he's got his dike built, now you're forced to have to tie yours in. You've got to pay attention that you do it right. So what you want to do is you want to take a portion of that dike that's already built apart, probably about four or five feet, depending on how high it is. If it's a smaller one, then you can, uh, but you want to be able to get hold of that poly. Or, if he's listened to one of our seminars and he remembered, I don't want to do what we do tonight, 
You'll notice that I started at the end of the poly. Think smart, right? Leave three or four feet of poly. At the price you're getting this poly, okay? So start when you start your two rows of sandbags, all right? Leave four feet of poly. Um, How far in front of the deck can you build a <coughs> Do you, okay. Um, We've got to go two feet. Two feet all right, I'm going to, this one here, this row here should be, uh, should be flush. And I'm surprised that uh, we let Al get away with that. Okay. Two rows flush. Okay, two rows flush. And it's, and a secret, a secret is you can only go back when you're running parallel to the water. That's the only time you can go back. All right, the question was, if you always run parallel on the ground, you understand now that I can come in on the dry side and I can add, remember I said even rows? So I go and add two rows running parallel to the water and I can come in on the back side then I put two this way, two parallel, and I build this dike right up so now I can make it wider if it's starting to leak, if I'm getting excessive seepage underneath the dike, and now I can build the dike higher and wider. That's why we want you to keep you away from something because if, if a dike starts to go, you want to add to the dry side of it. Apparently I've got about three minutes. Let's get Ed up here. And uh, Ed has an excellent suggestion, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, um, but he's got an idea on how to, uh, I'll, I'll just let him get his uh, fancy contraptions here, and uh, I'll advise you right now, he's, no, he's not witching for water. But what he's going to do, he has an excellent suggestion on how to transfer the, uh, the height that's been, de been designated by what's been surveyed, and you want to be able to transfer that height from the stake into your dike. Thank you. One of the many talented people from St. Paul. <coughs> Uh, apparently you're lost. So there's a strip of wood and it has an arrow and a horizontal line and it's a stop of dike. That elevation has to correspond with the top of the dike. Now if you have a good carpenter's eye, you can just... or you can use a carpenter's level. And what you do, you need two people for this... Uh, well, there's three people. Um, I'll hold this. Now, you, uh, let's do it this way. You look over the, over the edge. I hold, I eyeball in this bubble so that it's horizontal. And then you hold your hand, higher or lower. Okay, move your, move the, your arm, sir. Thing is sure. horizontal. So, you see, now this elevation has now been transferred to the finger of uh, our uh, taskmaster. And uh, now suppose that your reference mark is not an easy place like this, where you can, on your knees, where you can eyeball it in, but suppose it is down below. Here, it becomes a bit awkward to do that. Al can do it. So? <laughs> <laughs> they know you. If you, if you want to do it easier, you do it with a couple of sticks. And um, this stick, this stick plus the thickness of my level is the same as the height of this stick. You see? They are the same. All right. So now, when you give that stick to... Uh, so now, we do the same thing, let us say I want to transfer this level, the upper, the upper ring of here, 
I want to transfer that over there. I hold my stick here, the level on top. Oops. Okay, I'll know you look over it again. So <laughs> I hold it horizontal and then uh, right there. Okay. Now oh. the lower end of that stick is now the same elevation as this one. So you have transferred this now to this. And the only tools are a carpenter's level and a couple of sticks and you can transfer your levels all over the place. Way to go ahead. <coughs> We're going to get all you people on a bus, we're going to travel all over the world building dikes when this is done. <laughs> Are we done now and out here? I'm going to uh, get Ed down and I think... Um, just hold on for a second. I got a quick uh, uh, all right, uh, Jack's got a quick announcement. Uh, we'll be going inside. Uh, I'm also going to be inside. Uh, if there's any questions that you wanted to ask me...
Lisa Furster out here. We're on the Red River right now. We're out here with the Harbor Master, and we're going to check out some of the. It's right over here that we're looking at over here on this side. Um, are these is there are these people in danger, or what about these large trees over here? Uh, no, the trees are in danger, uh, but no, they should stay because uh, they're they're pretty well firmly on the ground. Uh, some of them will fall down, uh, but and we we lose a lot of trees every year anyway. They're organic; they come and they go, and they rot and some more grow. Uh, we remove all the obstacles in the water, like any uh, thing that's stuck in the river so nobody will hit it, uh, any plastics or tanks or barrels or shopping carts, we remove everything. And uh, we have done a good job at it and everything is gone. Uh, but the high water along these banks here, uh, you'll see that there is sandbagging that has been done. You can see some sandbags in there now uh, that they're, they're, they've measured to the height of 26 feet. Uh, so it really it's, uh, it's deceiving as the slope of the land goes up and down. But you can see all this, and we're coming to much more sandbags away around Gateway Packers here. And you can see how he's protected his property. It's on the east side of the Red River, just north of the Redwood Bridge. Uh, you can see all the uh, diking systems uh, that's been set up, uh, all the sandbagging. There's thousands and thousands of sandbags right along here uh, to protect all these houses. Uh, I guess next again. Will they have to um, sandbag any higher than? Oh, I believe there are the engineers have gone down and checked everything, all the levels, and uh, they've uh, built to those levels required. If they have to be go higher, then they're prepared to build them higher. Uh, we're on Scotia now, uh, along the north, uh, uh, along the Red River, north of the uh, end of Winnipeg, and you can see the uh, tens of thousands of sandbags. Some are built to eight, nine, ten feet high. Uh, you can see some sandbaggers there, all, probably all volunteers, maintaining it uh, and building it up again. Uh, they're just, uh, they've just been up by the thousands here. You can see uh, right along, you'll see people uh, uh, working away at it. Um, they've been working here for, you know, for weeks. It'll probably be an hour. What time is it now? As you can see, there's a lot of sandbaggers up here, uh, people volunteering to help with the tens of thousands of sandbags that it's taking in this area to keep the water out of these homes along the edge of the Red River. They're all saying hi to us, so uh, give them a friendly wave at home for all these uh, hardy workers here. Are these particularly older homes? Uh, there, yes, they are. Their uh, home's oh, probably built in the 30s, 40s, 50s. That is North Dyke around one of the houses and the pumping station. We're at, uh, um, oh, I just can't remember the name of this particular street, uh, but there's a very large sewer outlet here and a pumping station in case it rains or they can't handle the flow of the water on the other side. What's that earth dyke made of? Just plain earth or is there clay? Dirt, just clay, yes. Just dug up at the, probably at the Brady Landfill site somewhere where they've been taking it out by the hundreds of trucks every day. There's hundreds and hundreds of volunteers here. If uh, you folks can see that at home, they're all waving to us. Um, these people have come out to donate their time to help the sandbag in this particular area to help protect these homes from the ever-creeping Red River. It's amazing how many people are out there, and this seems to be a lot of young people out there, so don't think that because you're a younger person, you can't help too. Look at all those sandbaggers, all those wonderful volunteers. We owe them a great... think that there'll be any flood damage to the St. Boniface Hospital here? Uh, I don't think so. As I say, they're building it two feet higher than expected water, but uh, they have disaster plans in operation, and uh, uh, if they have to evacuate, they're all prepared to do that. Think um, these folks are going to be kept dry? Well, let's hope as long as the, uh, they've built the sandbagging, uh, the uh, dike system as uh, prescribed, uh, I'm sure it will stay. Yeah. It's just the length of time that it has to last. Yeah. Uh, that, that water level looks pretty high right there. Uh, oh yeah, they're up to the sandbags already, and uh, that'll stay like that, and they'll be about two feet above it, and uh, if they have to add to it, they will, and they'll be watched day and night. 
Well, we're on uh, St. Mary's Road at St. Anne's. Uh, there's some civic offices here. They're bag sandbagging at the rear of it. You see a number of people working there. It looks like there might be, what, an earth down there, too? Uh, no, no, I don't see any fresh earth. Uh, oh, yes, there could be. No, I don't see any fresh earth here, no. People sandbagging their front of their homes here, getting ready. Looks like it's creeping up. Okay, where are we? Where are we? What part of the city are we in now? We're at Kingston Road, coming up to the Furmore Bridge, uh, Save Hotel Bridge, and uh, there you can see there are sandbagging, and there's some area there. It looks like about 10 feet of sandbags. Uh, they're uh, just going around there, and all those kids uh, sandbagging and waving back at us. This is still down around the King's Row area. Still a lot of sandbaggers out there, working away, trying to keep ahead of the Red River. We are south of the perimeter on Highway 75. We're right in the midst of the building of some new land dikes to shore up the floodway protection. And as you can see, they've been making a great effort. They have all the equipment out here, and there's a lot of manpower and it's a very busy scene and we just arrived here to give you an idea some kind of sense of what is going to be happening in the next few days to try and protect the city what we're going to be doing we're going to be uh, pulling the rails and the ties in panels okay so what we're going to be doing we're going to be uh, lifting the rails rails and uh, the ties all together and we're going to be hauling it north and we're going to let it down. You see, they want us to remove the rails and the, and the ties so that they can dig the ballast and the gravel down to the clay so they can make a good seal for the dike. The yeah. process is moving quickly? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, like it only takes a couple. Cut the rail, undo a couple joints. That's what holds the rails together. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a, not a long process to get ready. They're continuing work on the dike, and there is a large amount of machinery and manpower still working at this spot. They are continuing to build the dike up to the highway this evening, and they are waiting for updates to decide how far they are going to have the dike go. Right now, the 75 highway, there's still two lanes of traffic left open side how to proceed with this new dirt plugged in flood 97 Okay, this is Dick Reeves, and we're right now in the, uh, in the background. We have a lot of our sandbaggers who have a lot to do with what's going on. Roy Verbrugge, who uh, they tell me is the man who holds the light while Marcel Lorando chops the wood. Is that right? I'm not sure about light and wood, but Marcel doesn't do hardly anything, and I do all the work. Boy, there you go. There's a, there's a proud man. You know what? I'll tell you something. Despite what's happening here, we have to keep our spirits You're high. You're right. And, and You're Roy, right. I'll tell you, we're in a situation here now. You've got some great volunteers behind you. How many sandbags do you think we filled here in the Fort Richmond Plaza? How about, what, 10, 12,000? 10, 10,000. And rolling. That's amazing. And considering the city's putting out 200,000 a day, and that's on top of what the city's doing. And this is the kids mainly. As you can see, they are fabulous. Yeah, good stuff. Nobody can say that those adults are uh, kind of beating the kids. When did Operation start here? Uh, two days ago. No, last, la night. last night. And yes. they run until what time? As long as 
as they're willing to work, there's lights up there, and we keep right on trucking. Good stuff. Okay. Are... Obviously, I noticed we got rice bags we're filling. Rice bags? I didn't know. And it says made for rice. We'll fill them anyway. <laughs> well, that's great stuff. Now, uh, Roy, anything you want to say to the public in general about more help, more volunteers? We'll take more volunteers filling the sandbags. The other aspect is, as time goes along, different areas open up, different requirements are needed, and we play it on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So please come right in, volunteer, and we're also coordinating with our neighbors in St. Patel. We sent about uh, 300 in the same thing, and it's been working beautifully. Two communities working together right at this time out of this area. And what's interesting, too, is the sandbags that are coming out of here are staying around here. Richmond, St. Norbert, right where they're needed in this community. There you go. Good Thank stuff. Okay. Now, I want to step over here now. The guy just finally got off the telephone. I'll get back to tell, him, tell him goodbye. Yeah, yeah I got to go. Say goodbye. Brian. He's got to go. He's Bye. on TV now. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, you've been right in here, too. For me, we've been making sure we had all the uh, volunteers out at the proper sites and coordinating the areas, but we'll start making our own to try and supplement it. Marcel, a uh, question. You know, a lot of people are wondering, you know, uh, and you've heard, and, and, and what we're trying to do with our Vidion and joint effort of Vidion and Shell coverage is dispel a lot of the rumors because we've got to keep people calm in this time of crisis. There's a lot of people saying that the government's not really telling us everything, that uh, they're just trying to hold back information. Is that so? No, it isn't. The government, and that's part of what I'm doing right now, is trying to relieve some of those anxieties. We're hearing from a lot of people that they're really concerned. And and we're here to make sure that it's we're here, that we're going to protect them in the long run. You've heard all the rumors that, that are going around. There's a crack in the sense. The Duffy's ditch will work. It has worked, and it'll work again. Okay, talking about raising now, is there any, uh, there, there's been some talk about raising the uh, area around the floodway, diking? Uh... we got to be very careful. As the law clearly states that we can't raise it beyond a certain point. I mean, if we raise it above a certain level, we'll flood everything to the south of Winnipeg, and even their ring dikes wouldn't work. So, I mean, that wouldn't make much sense until there was a real crisis for the city of Winnipeg. We've got to wait till that. We can't be driving around saying we're going to do it or can't do it. Let's study the issue and see where it's at. And again, just to reiterate, there's nothing that's being held back. I mean, what we're talking about as the crest is the crest that's forecasted as of today. As of today, that is the crest. Okay. We've got a foot and a half of free play. And a bit of good news, too, is the fact that the Assiniboine has crested. Uh, so I heard, just heard about an hour ago. I, have, I haven't yet confirmed it. The, the, uh, uh, in the question period today in the House, uh, as of today, the 25th, uh, the uh, statement was made by the minister that uh, the Assiniboine had crested, and the only thing to be concerned about is residual water from the red flowing in up to about James Street. Yes, but the crest is still with the residual water. That's so exactly right. Until we understand the full impact of it, I'm not going to say that it's reached its crest. Well, that's all right. Good news. There you go. Well, anyway, hey, listen, I trust you guys, so uh, maybe I'm the fool. I don't know. But uh, anyway, things are going well here for you? 100% the vault at this time because we've been getting caught up on the bags. And we're sending bags now into the Wellington area and wherever they're being needed. So. Any message to your constituents? We can pull through this. The anxiety levels are high. Say a prayer and we can do it together. Thank there you. There you go. Marcel Lorando, ladies and gentlemen, MLA, and uh, thank you very much. Continued success. Thank you. Good to see you on the line. Keep the volunteers coming out. We'll do it. All right, the volunteers, you heard it right there from Marcel. We need you in the Fort Richmond Plaza. The lights are above us. We can fill sandbags right till dark. Plenty of sand here, plenty of bags. They're not running out. And uh, feel free to... Now we're going to talk to some of our volunteers and uh, see how things are going, so we'll just walk back here. Okay, guys, now we got some of the volunteers here at Fort Richmond Plaza. What's your name? Jonathan Slick. Jonathan, how many bags you filled today? None. Hundred. Two. He has, can't even keep count there. Guys, what school? Acadia. Acadia? Everybody from Acadia? Yeah! Good job. And uh, so, uh, listen, got a, I got a question for you. I got a question for you. You guys have any idea how many bags you filled? I don't know. A lot. I don't mean, I don't mean individual, but have they given you any idea, any estimate of total number? No. Thousands. You know that, don't you? Yeah. yeah. You, you guys are doing a great job. What would you say? They said something about we filled 2,000 bags in two hours. Oh, I wouldn't doubt that a bit. As a matter of fact, we heard that also. So, congratulations. Good job. Big cheer for the school, guys. Yeah! Gentlemen, helping us out here with sandbagging operations is uh, Clyde Perry. And uh, Clyde is all also a private pilot, and uh, you have your own aircraft, and apparently you've taken a look at and surveyed the site from the air. That's correct, yes. Do people have any idea what's south of us? Oh, I don't know. I think some people do, but it was from halfway through the city. All I could see was water south of the perimeter, right to the horizon on either side. To the to the east and west? To the east and west, yeah. And uh, that is, and you were probably flying at what, 2,000 feet? 3,500 feet. 3,500 feet, water to the horizon. Yeah, That's, right to the uh, south. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, in your, now, I know you're, you're no flood expert. You're only no. a lay person like the rest of us when it comes to this sort of a, of a problem, but uh, what are your thoughts when you see something like that as far as 
the city of Winnipeg. Well, it just seems like it's it's, it's an island, but uh, what, what's amazing is all this turnout of these people. It's just uh, really, really incredible because, you know, you don't usually see anything like this, but when all these people are coming out and they realize their city is in danger, even with the, you know, what the floodway is doing and everything else, we still realize there still is a danger here, and all these people out, that's the most amazing thing. You know, and, and uh, I've heard so many people say the same thing. Sometimes it takes something disastrous yeah. to bring out the good in all of us. Oh, yeah, I think so, yeah. 75 just disappeared. The river's gone. It's just water. Can't even make out the river. No, it's gone. Unbelievable. Thanks Good. for your time. Good. Fine. I know you want to get back to work. Okay, that's it. Now we're here at the Fort Richmond Plaza. Let's check things out. This is Ron Williscroft. We're both with uh, St. John Ambulance in Manitoba. St. John has been uh, active over this last week at the various flood sites throughout the city. We have some 50 volunteers who have been providing first aid coverage at uh, many of the flood sites like Scotia, Greenview, uh, off at Kingston Row. We are finding that uh, most of the emergencies uh, we're running into with uh, people who are busy sandbagging are fatigue related um, problems. Most folk are experiencing sprains and strains, blisters, uh, and uh, that, that kind of um, any serious casualty. And uh, to date, uh, over the seven days that we've been there, some 1,200 hours of volunteer support provided by the St. John Ambulance volunteers. I'm going to switch over to Ron, who is going to tell us about uh, what St. John Ambulance, how it's set up its operation, and how we're kind of functioning throughout the city. Thanks, Joanne. We've actually been set up with an emergency operations center that was mobilized around uh, 10 a.m. on Friday last. Uh, we have staff that uh, location 24 hours a day with volunteer services uh, being provided by um, uh, management, if you will, of uh, the brigade operations. And uh, we're looking for any brigade members
members who currently have not been uh, contacted by their superintendents or divisional duty officers to give us a call at our St. John Operations Center at 784-7013 and you'll be deployed to various locations. We have been in contact with uh, uh, the City Emergency Operations Center and Volunteer Services to make sure that we're staffing the areas uh, of need appropriately right now and we are so uh, we also are in contact with uh, provincial emergency measures of course and receiving direction as needed there basically in a stand to escalate we can be prepared with our resources are you finding that uh, at uh, today in particular because of the rain that you're you're using different types of, uh, of equipment at the at the first aid sites I know that when I was at uh, a couple of the sites this week and it was a hot sunny day that, uh, you know, people were starting, it, it was really warm and the sandbags, my, are they ever heavy, these 40 pound sandbags, right. what equipment are you using on site then? Well, mostly uh, it uh, deals with people who are wearing short sleeve shirts, uh, mm -hmm. tend to get a lot of abrasions on the forearms. I noticed so, that happened to me as well. Right, so we're trying to make sure that we have enough supplies to take care of some minor cuts and scrapes and that sort of thing right away. Um, today, because of the rain, of course, we have have some concern that we don't want people who have any wounds or anything becoming infected. Uh, so we've deployed some of our mobile first aid posts and mobile first aid trailers at the various sites so that we can do treatments uh, inside out, out of the rain. Uh, we also have to be careful right now because it went sort of from very, very hot and people were starting to get sunburned. We have to make sure that our volunteers as well as the people out there that are doing the sandbags are warm enough and dry enough to, to do the job. Do you so think there might be some cases of hypothermia today? That's a possibility. Uh, hypothermia is a possibility even at warm temperatures if you happen to be very wet and outside for quite some time. Great. So we certainly expect St. John volunteers to be out in full force uh, for the rest of uh, these, uh, the f this flood and uh, I'm certainly thankful to uh, all of our volunteers who've had an opportunity to go out there and to be of service to the community. I'm here to uh, discuss issues related to the risk of sewer backup uh, as it relates to the elevation of the river that we're now experiencing in the city of Winnipeg. One of the fundamental principles of sewers is that as the river elevation increases, uh, the capacity of the sewer decreases. And uh, that's an important concept to accept because it's difficult to understand in many cases. Uh, in the city of Winnipeg, I've lost it. Take a breath. I'm trying. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll start over again. The risk of sewer backup in the city of Winnipeg as respects rising water levels. Now, one fundamental principle is the capacity of the sewers uh, falls. We were expecting until a few weeks ago uh, river levels to be on the order of what they were last year. That was the forecast. And that forecast is consistent with uh, also levels that we experienced in 1979. In how the sewer system reacts to that kind of a river level. Uh, what's different this year is over the past two weeks, the forecast has gradually risen to a point where last year up to maybe six to seven feet higher than they were last year. At those kinds of river elevations, our sewer system has never uh, experience system reacts to those types of river elevations and so the consequence of that is that is that we really don't understand fully uh, how much rainfall it would take to cause the sewer system capacity to fall to the point where it could not handle that rainfall you want me to get right into that don't uh, a, uh, a backup valve and a sump pit system the risk of sewer backup in your home is reduced substantially and if you, uh, if you have that type of a system, the best thing you can do right now is uh, to check that system out thoroughly and get familiar with, your, with it yourself. In, type, in terms of the sewer backup valve, uh, in the middle of the front of your basement, you'll find a square piece of plywood embedded in the concrete. And uh, you should take a, a cold chisel and, and take that thing out take the plywood off with a screwdriver it will pry out and beneath that piece of plywood is a uh, is basically a fitting with a screw on cap that's about three and a half inches in diameter and you might need uh, a wrench to help you with this but you, you unscrew it and you take a look down there and there's a flapper valve down in inside that fitting and if you were to say flush the toilet you could observe down there and watch that flapper move back and forth and then you know that it's working 
right, so you put the cap back on, you put the plywood back on, and you know you're confident that you're protected from sewer backup. In terms of your, uh, your sump pump, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that it's running. Like most sump pumps have been running, and so you probably know that already. But uh, in any case, the easy way to check a sump pump is if you've got a pedestal type, which is a type that sticks above the floor of the concrete, simply raise the lever and make sure that it runs. And when you let go of the lever, it should stop. Also, make sure that your hose is running freely, the discharge hose. It'll run outside somewhere. And uh, make sure that it's not plugged by debris or it's not iced up. We had a lot of problems with icing over about three weeks ago, but now the ice should be melted. You shouldn't have that problem now. Should it be running constantly? No, it shouldn't be running constantly, but we have heard that there are places in Winnipeg where the water table is quite high, where with the snow melt that we're having and the bad drainage around some of the houses, as the snow melts, it comes up against the house, goes down into your weeping tile, and in those circumstances, you'll find that your sump pump might be running every five or six minutes, which is quite a bit. But be running the, the, the hose from the sump pump away from the house then? Yes, that's, a, that's very good advice. Uh, a lot of these uh, sump pumps, especially when you, when you first buy your house, all, all it is is a discharge pipe on the side of the house and it just discharges to ground and what that'll do will erode uh, a, a part of the earth along the side of the house and provide an, an easy path for that water to come back down into your weeping tile. And then all you're doing is you're pumping your water around in circles. So it's a good idea to get a go to go to the store and buy a, a discharge hose, and extend that hose. They usually come in 25 foot lengths out to the front of the house, and then that way you know that once you get rid of that water, it's not going to come back on you. How about drains and eaves troughs? That's very good advice as well. Uh, your eaves troughs. Uh, I guess they're not as much of a drainage issue in terms of the snow melt, but certainly when it rains, you want to make sure that that water gets away from the house far enough that it won't come up against the house again. And that's that can be a problem with backyard drainage, but certainly wherever you can, direct that uh, eaves trough, put extensions on it. Uh, some people use bricks to brick it up to make sure that it won't go away on you. And discharge that, that water far away from the house. But make sure, whatever you do, don't discharge it onto your neighbor's property because then he has to deal with the problem. Find a way to angle that, that thing over, put a bend in it or whatever, but, but get it away from the house and leave it away from your neighbor's place. But not back into the sewer system. No, <laughs> oh, not back into the sewer system. I don't know if that's what I really want to say. Oh, yeah, the other thing. What if you don't have a backup valve in the sump pump. All houses that were constructed since 1978 in the city of Winnipeg, constructed before that, they may have a backup valve and not have a sump pump, or they may have neither. Well, the important thing is to find out what your situation is, whether you have one or not. If you don't have a backup valve or, or a sump pump, our recommendation right now is that considering the increased risk of uh, sewer backup, because of the height of the river and because we're bound to be at that elevation for three to four weeks, we're bound to get a rainfall and we don't know if we're going to get the type of rainfall that we will be able to accommodate with our sewer system or not. If you don't have a backup valve, there's a, there's, there's a chance that you may experience sewer backup. You might want to get on the phone right now, call your plumber, have one installed. I think you'll find that it's very late in the game to be trying that now. I, I think that plumbers are very backed up. I don't know if you'll be able to get one done uh, within the next week or two or three. So our advice under those circumstances, again, is to use reason. Uh, it's, not, it's not a for sure guarantee that you're going to get a basement flooding situation just because you don't have a backup valve. It's a higher risk, but that's all it is. So if you use a little common sense, and if you do have valuables in the basement that are easily movable, we'd recommend that you move them to uh, an upstairs uh, location where they'll be safe. Things such as portable computers wind up in the basement a lot, and they're easy to move to a different location. And uh, papers, filing, uh, you know, you may have uh, your insurance papers down there. So move those up too. Uh, anything that's easy to move, uh, we'd suggest that you move them. Me and my husband have been living here for 35 years, and we've always seen water. In 79, we didn't have to have a dike, but this year they say we do have to have one. When we bought the house in 1964, we had a dike then, but we still built the house, bought the house, and uh, we water skied on the river, we had a dock on the river, we, we uh, water skied and done several things, and the kid, children have all left, and we are alone. And 
all the fun we had. <laughs> but we're thinking of selling anyways. And how because we can't look after it. It is very upsetting. We just got from heat back from Arizona on Monday, a week today. Enjoyed it over there. And we winter down there and come here for the summer and enjoy our yard. Plant my flowers. I got a garden. Got an apple tree. Now they're sandbagging over my lilies. <laughs> How does it feel to have uh, all these people coming out? Oh, I think it's great, really. I think they're doing a good job. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and Salvation Army for the food and for everything and for all the friendly people and all the killed children. Kids are really helpful and really good. I can't complain. It's beautiful living here. See the muskrat. I just seen a big pat muskrat going by here yesterday. Feed my ducks down below. And it's sorry to have our yard messed up like this, but fortunately we probably will do some other things, like build a retaining wall here, and we'll have to do it again. And I'm off. I brought my son and a friend down here tonight to volunteer. They asked if they could participate in the sandbagging going on in the city, and we just called in actually around 6 o'clock, and they said they had a call coming in for 6.30 to assist on Kingston Row and we thought we'd come down and see what we could do to help out and uh, when we got here we were surprised at the number of people already here um, and the call had just come in for 6.30 and uh, in fact they didn't know if there was room for line for them to get into line to help but they're right at the start there throwing the sandbags on to the pile. Um, how does it feel to have your sons asked to come down here and do something like this? Oh, it feels great. I think it's great for them. They're enjoying it. In fact, last night they went out to Scotia Street to see if they could help, and they worked there for about an hour. And um, I think it's great when the teenagers can participate like that. Um, and then when they suggest it, I know a lot of their friends in school are helping out too, and I think it'll be a good memory for them and great for them to see the community spirit. They made a lot of friends in the line last night. They were all helping each other, and they were so pumped up they wanted to come out and help again tonight. So I'm very pleased. Hi, my name is Paul Glue. I'm one of the volunteers here at 83 Kingston Row. We've got a whole group of people. We also have 150 people working here tonight. We're building a dike all the way around the house. It's the second time we're raising this dike up. The volunteers are working really well. We're going to increase by going to other addresses because they're not tired yet. And uh, I, uh, I think the volunteers are doing a good job. The young, the old, the young, the ladies, the men, everybody. And that's all I have to say, just keep helping. I've been a homeowner for three years now, and I'm taking advantage of the incredible Winnipeg help that we're seeing here today. It's, uh, it's the second time we've had to do this now. Saturday we put up uh, 4,000 sandbags. We just had another 2,000 delivered. And hopefully that's going to cover it. This top of dike is top of river height. I'm hoping it doesn't come any higher than that. As most people know, it's not covered by flood insurance, so anything w that we can do to uh, to promote the, the water staying on this side of it is uh, is what we're going to do today, and, and the help is incredible. I made one phone call two hours ago uh, to the line, and this, this is what you get, and this is absolutely incredible. There's probably five or six friends mixed in, and everybody else is neighbors I've never met, and people from all over. I just got cookies from Fort Gary, and we've got drinks from another part of town, and it really just shows the generosity of the people in the city. Uh, same thing, other side of the other side of the, the valley, I'll call it here. Uh, people that th these people just moved in. I mean, they didn't know anybody in the area, and they've received nothing but help and uh, generosity from all around. So, uh, it, you know, if this is a show of what we can expect in in a time like this, it, it really is incredible. And yeah, it sounds sort of funny, but this is you know, it makes you feel good about the city that you live in. So, what uh, whatever I can do to thank them, I'm going to do. And unfortunately, mostly it's you know, it's just saying you know, shake a hand and saying thank you so much but for that I am grateful to every one of these and people if they see it on the news or if they see it in the segment somewhere thank you everybody and uh, you're doing just a fantastic job thanks again what again hi my name is Neil James I'm here helping everybody sound big and I go to summer school I am eight year old years old and if anybody wants to come down and help come down and help at 82 Kingston Road. 82 Kingston Road. Right here at this beautiful house. Come down and enjoy the fun.